Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries coming from white dwarfs that help the scientists answer a really interesting question. What exactly are some of the other terrestrial planets made out of? And the answer to this question is quite surprising. Turns out that a lot of planets out there are extremely exotic. So let's discuss this particular discovery in more detail, starting with the idea of terrestrial planets themselves. One of the bigger questions today is of course, are our planets in other star systems going to be relatively similar to what we have here in the solar system, at least in terms of the composition and in terms of the structure? So for example, if we take a look at the iconic TRAPPIST-1 system, and if we take a look at the terrestrial planets discovered here, are we going to be discovering planets with relatively similar minerals and composition, or are they going to be entirely different and something that we can't even imagine right now? And considering that the scientists have already discovered several thousand different planets out there, with many of them being terrestrial, this of course presents a very intriguing mystery that needs to be solved. Especially if we want to find out more about potential extraterrestrial life, or even extraterrestrial intelligence living somewhere out there. But because of the way that we find these planets, usually by looking at shadows or by looking at various interaction with the star, it's generally difficult to know exactly what these planets are made out of. However, there is at least one way the scientists are aware of. And it's actually called archaeology, specifically stellar archaeology. There's a way to study the leftovers of different planets by looking at specific star systems. And then, by studying what these leftovers are, we can maybe determine what these planets used to be made out of. In other words, instead of looking at existing planets, we can hypothetically look at some of the planets that used to exist and then sort of extrapolate some of the findings based on that. And one of the best known ways to do this is by actually studying the atmospheres of the multiple white dwarfs we've discovered in the last few decades. White dwarfs, as you might already know, are essentially the end product for a lot of different stars, including our sun. It's also going to become a white dwarf in the next few billions of years. And once the star becomes a white dwarf, it's going to stay a white dwarf for billions and even trillions of years. And during that time, because of various gravitational interactions, it's slowly going to absorb a lot of the matter orbiting around it. And here we're talking about things like asteroids, space dust, and of course the leftovers from various planets, or even planets themselves. And so a lot of these leftovers from various objects are going to eventually end up on the surface of the white dwarf itself, thus contaminating some of its atmosphere. And because white dwarfs generally still emit quite a lot of light that we can then process using modern techniques, by looking at what this light passes through and by seeing what spectra of light are being absorbed and what spectra of light pass through the atmosphere allows the scientists to establish specifically what elements and what components are present in the atmosphere of these white dwarfs. Which then, in effect, helps them understand what this star system might have had in terms of the composition and what some of the planets might have been made out of. So this is why this is generally called stellar archaeology, although it obviously has other names as well. And so the scientists behind this recent paper you can find in the description below decided to take a look at 23 well-known polluted white dwarfs or white dwarfs with a lot of different components in their atmosphere, with all of them located within about 650 light years away from the solar system. And in this case they focused on the white dwarfs where a lot of the things have already been measured by a lot of different observatories, with things like magnesium, iron, silica and calcium already previously detected and measured in a lot of these objects. But just finding these elements is not enough. The scientists still have to try to reconstruct what sort of potential minerals could form from all of these elements to then create the planet itself. For example, if we take our own planet, planet Earth, if we were to somehow identify just the elements present inside the planet, we're going to discover that for the most part this is all silicon, iron, magnesium, aluminium and oxygen. Similar to the stuff discovered in those white dwarfs. But each of those elements in turn then forms various, very specific minerals each of them having very specific properties. As a matter of fact, the properties of these minerals is what makes planet Earth so unique. And for Earth, a lot of these elements form two major minerals. The mineral known as olivine that contains magnesium, iron, silicon and oxygen. And the mineral known as pyroxene that contains silicon, aluminium, oxygen and sometimes sodium, iron and magnesium. And a few other elements. And so in other words, the minerals or the production of these minerals is actually essential to the planet itself. For example, some of these minerals are going to be able to dissolve much more water, and so the planet might not be as wet in a sense. 
Whereas some other minerals, if they're developed in a certain way, they might be extremely strong and thus prevent any plate tectonics and the development of various cycles that are essential for the planet and for the establishment of life. On the other hand, if the actual minerals are very weak, they might result in some extreme plate tectonics and the effects of this are obviously not known to us. And so when analyzing the white dwarfs that they were looking at, they have actually discovered something a little bit more unusual. They've discovered that a lot of these white dwarfs had a much, much bigger variety of different compositions possible than any of the planets we have here in the solar system, including some of the more extreme planets like Venus. Which also suggests that a lot of these planets in these other star systems might have had extremely different minerals and a lot of different rock composition that's just not present or even imaginable here on planet Earth. And some of these rocks and some of these unusual compositions were so extreme that the scientists even had to create special names for them. One of the examples here is quartz pyroxenites, also periclase dunites. So these would be some extremely new types of rocks that would exist on these distant planets or have existed in the past, but are definitely not present anywhere in the solar system. And by definition, this would make all of these terrestrial planets that existed around these white dwarfs exotic which means that they would be very difficult to imagine, very difficult for us to understand, and their properties would be extremely difficult to establish since we have no idea what these minerals are like and what sort of properties they have on those planets. So for example, if one of these planets had a mineral with much lower um, melting point, it might actually look something like this. It would end up having extremely thick crust that would be practically unbreakable. And so in a sense, the conditions on these planets would be maybe similar to what we have on Venus, where we don't have any plate tectonics or any interaction on the surface. But here, even volcanoes might be extremely rare because of the thickness and the strength of the crust. And according to the scientists, even some of the previous studies were able to discover certain elements that seem to be present in, for example, Earth, Earth crust specifically, but a lot of these elements are very minor, they're not actually that important. They don't really form the majority of the minerals. And so instead, by measuring the major elements, such as, for example, silicon, and then by measuring the amount of various elements present, it may become possible to work out what sort of minerals these planets were made out of. Also, interestingly, in a lot of these white dwarfs, the majority of the elements discovered were magnesium and not silicon. And to the scientists behind this paper, this means that a lot of the material that was essentially swallowed by the white dwarfs very likely came from within the planets themselves, not so much the outside part, not the crust or the atmosphere. In other words, what we are probably looking at here are the leftovers of different mantles of different terrestrial planets. And this is a bit intriguing because in this case the scientists even suggest that none of these white dwarfs seem to contain the crust of the planets. Which means that either these planets never had any crust or the crust was somehow removed before the planets collided with the white dwarf. But having no evidence of this crust or basically the surface of the planet is a little bit intriguing. Although one obvious explanation here is of course that maybe crust just represents a very very small fraction of the entire planet and so it's just not visible in these observations. But the most exciting part of the discovery in this case is really just the different proportions of different elements discovered in these white dwarfs. Which of course implies that a lot of these planets, despite being terrestrial, are extremely different from any of the planets in the solar system and might have extremely different properties and thus ability to, for example, sustain life. Which could also be another important keyhole for the existence of, for example, extraterrestrial life. Maybe Earth once again got super lucky. It just happened to have the right composition of the right minerals to create the right conditions. To create the conditions, for example, for extremely active plate tectonics, very large ocean that covers most of the planet, and most importantly, the cycle that lasts for billions of years. So maybe for the planet to look like this and to be so much similar to planet Earth, it does need to have these very specific minerals that are present on planet Earth as well. And maybe a lot of these other exotic planets look and behave in a very, very different manner. Which once again could be one of these potential explanations why we're not hearing any other aliens out there. Maybe their planets are just not good enough. Anyway, so that's a pretty interesting study, a very interesting discovery, and something that I'm sure will follow up with some of the future videos once the scientists discover even more about the potential composition of various terrestrial planets. With many of these studies helping us figure out how different, how truly different, a lot of these distant planets are compared to planet Earth. 
And so until then, check out the study in the description below. The study, by the way, was written by an astronomer and a geologist, which is a perfect combination for studying this particular topic, with all of the other relevant links in the description below as well. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the one full person t-shirt you can find in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.